Hi guys. Uh, so today we're going to be doing um, chapter 12 and chapter 13, which is basics of chemistry and basics of electricity. Um, they're fairly short chapters, so I like to do them together to kind of get them over with. Um, same as the test will be with both of the chapters together. Um, I just find it's kind of easier to get them both done and over with in one time because they are fairly short chapters. So why do you think it's important that we study chemistry? Because without a basic understanding, we're not able to use professional products because everything that we use with our clients um, is a chemical from shampoo to even water, um, any of our styling aids, our hair color, um, perm solution, um, relaxer, all of those things are a chemical. So it's really important that we understand um, how those things are made and how they react with each other so that we don't cause, you know, obviously injury to ourselves or our clients. Um, and you'll be able to actually troubleshoot issues. So if you had anything like, um, you know, an issue with a color correction, everything that we do to fix that is, you know, done with a chemical. So it's really important that we understand how to do that. Uh, so how does the science of chemistry influence uh, cosmetology. Well, chemistry is the science that deals with the composition, structures, and properties of matter and how matter changes under different conditions. Um, organic chemistry is the study of substances that contain the element carbon. All living things um, that were once alive, whether they are plants, animals, contain carbon. Hair color products, chemical texturizers, shampoos, conditioners, styling aids, um, they're all organic chemicals. Inorganic chemistry is the study of substances that do not contain carbon that may contain hydrogen. So metals, minerals, glass, water, air, pure water, oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, um, those are inorganic substances. So what is matter? So matter is any substance that occupies space and has mass or weight. All matter has physical and chemical properties and exists in the form of a solid, liquid, or gas. This is basically going back to like grade 11 chemistry class. Um, since matter is made from a chemical, everything made out of matter is a chemical. So an element uh, is the simplest form of chemical matter. So if you remember the periodic table of elements um, that we had in high school in our science class, the big table of elements, um, everything that basically is, is starts from an element. Uh, elements cannot be broken down into a similar, a simpler substance without their loss of identity. All matter in the universe is made up of the 118 known elements and they have their own physical and chemical properties. Um, and an atom is a basic unit of matter with a nucleus at the center surrounded by negatively charged electrons that move around the nucleus in orbits and the nucleus consists of protons, which is a positive charge, and neutrons, which is a negative charge, and the number of protons determines the type of element. So again, here's sort of the periodic table of elements. So the ones that we sort of use the most in what it is that we do are obviously hydrogen, um, iron, carbon, oxygen, those are the, some, what, the most sort of ones that we use, you know, dealing with hair. Um, so it's important that we kind of, you know, understand that those are the purest forms. So an elemental molecule is a chemical combination of atoms of the same element in fixed proportions. So if you look at the picture, it shows hydrogen, which is H2, which is two... Um, equal um, proportions of hydrogen. So H and H together, they're equal, and that gives you an elemental molecule. Same as oxygen, which is O2. It's two um, molecules of the same element in a fixed proportion. Nitrogen, same thing. It's um, two fixed proportions of nitrogen. Now, a compound molecule are chemical compounds of two or more atoms with different elements in fixed proportions. So nitrogen oxide, which is NO. Again, it's one part nitrogen, one part oxygen. 
H2O, which is water, is two parts of hydrogen, one part oxygen, um, and carbon dioxide, right? It's two parts of oxygen, one part carbon, which means C1 and O2 means two oxygen, one carbon. And then our picture at the bottom is a picture of an atom with its nucleus, its protons, its neutrons, and its electrons. So the states of matter. Um, again, kind of going back to our grade 11 chemistry class, um, it either is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. And depending on what state that it's in, so if it's a solid, let's use the example of water. So water as a solid is ice. You melt ice, it becomes a liquid. You boil water, it becomes a gas or a vapor. So those are sort of the, the ways of showing um, something that changes in its state. Physical properties of matter. So properties that are observable or measurable and will keep the same comp uh, composition. Um, physical properties are color, size, odor, density, luster, hardness, condensing, melting point, solubility, conductivity, and the boiling point. So these are the things, um, they keep the same comp composition, which means they don't, nothing new is created from their physical properties. So with chemical properties are only observable during a chemical reaction which means something new is created, um, which is, you know, um, a chemical reaction, basically. So the property is the ability to change, whereas the change is the action itself. Some chemical properties include reactivity, combustibility, or flammability. So you think of it, if you mix two things together, um, that causes a chemical reaction, or you mix two things together and it becomes combustible or flammable. So that's the difference between a physical property and a chemical property. Pure substance is a chemical combination of matter. It is defined, or pardon me, it is definite or fixed proportions. So pure substance as an example, which is A, all the, all the, um, the, the matter is the same, same as B, and then a physical mixture is the physical combination of matter in any proportion. The properties of a physical mixture are, uh, they combine the physical properties of substances in the mixture, i.e. salt, water is a physical mixture. So if you think of the diagram that I have here with the pure substance green and the pure substance purple, uh, the water the green being water and the purple being salt, and you mix them together and that gives you salt water. So that's what they mean by um, a physical mixture. So the difference between a solute, a solvent, and a solution. So the solid that dissolves in a liquid is called the solute. So if you had, um, let's say, you had something like, like the new thing, that I guess that's kind of, the new thing is the uh, like the the hot chocolate bomb. So if you put a hot chocolate bomb in hot water and it dissolves into the liquid, the chocolate bomb, hot chocolate bomb, would be considered the solute. The liquid in which the solute dissolves is called the solvent. So that means the boiling water would be considered the solvent. And the liquid that we get when a solute dissolves in a solvent is called a solution. So you take the hot chocolate bomb the hot water, so the solute and the solvent, mix them together and then you have a solution. So um, our other examples are sugar plus milk e equals sweet milk or chocolate milk. If you did chocolate sauce, milk and make chocolate milk or salt water makes salty water. So there's miscible and immiscible liquids. Miscible liquids are liquids that are able to mix. So if you took water and alcohol, they mix together perfectly. You would never know they were there. Um, immiscible liquids are liquids that are not able to mix. So oil and water, where if you put oil and water in a cup, the oil will rise to the top and the water will sit on the bottom, which means that they do not, they do not mix together easily. 
So with an emulsion, you have the immiscible liquid, so i.e. oil, and you need something to um, emulsify it to be able to make them mix together. So that's called an emulsion. And sand that does not dissolve, does not dissolve in the solvent, therefore the mixture is considered a suspension. So because the, or the sand all sits on the bottom, the water stays at the top. The solvent, which is the water, does not dissolve the sand. So it is considered a suspension. And then moving into surfactants. So surfactants are substances that allow water and oil to mix or emulsify. Um, oil and water emulsion is created when oil droplets um, emulsifies in water. The droplets of water are surrounded by a surfactant molecules with their lipophilic tails pointing in their hydraulic, sorry, hydrophilic heads pointing out. So looking at the picture of the surfactant, the hydrophilic water loving head, so it kind of looks like a little tadpole. Um, and then, so what it does is that the hydrophilic um, is water loving and the lipophilic is oil loving. So that's kind of the way you differentiate. Common product ingredients. So a lot of the things that we use have ingredients um, like glycerin. Glycerin is a sweet colorless oily substance uh, used as a solvent and a moisturizer. So if you think of glycerin as like say like a val Vaseline type idea where it's sort of we use it as a um, protector of the skin. Um, silicones are used in hair conditioners, uh, water resistant lubricants for the skin, less greasy than other oils and can impart a smooth silky feel and give hair shine. Um, silicones are used in a lot of our um, styling products as well to add shine. Volatile organic compounds or VOCs, we've heard of those for years. Um, two or more elements combined chemically that contain carbon and evaporate quickly, which means that they're volatile. And the most common VOC um, used in, hair in hairsprays is ethyl alcohol. So VOCs have really, um, the beauty industry as well as others have really tried to get rid of VOCs because they were actually really dangerous. So we try and have a minimal amount of VOCs in our products and our chemicals. So different, again, different products that we're going to find in some of our um, things that we use. Alcohol, evaporating colorless liquid. Um, it's obtained by the fermentation of starch, sugars, and carbohydrates. Uh, alkalinamines are substances to neutralize acids or raise the pH of products used in place of ammonia because it has less odor, uh, again, such as permanent wave. Ammonia, colorless gas with a pungent odor. If you've ever used straight ammonia, you know what that's like. Um, it's composed of hydrogen and nitrogen. Used to raise the pH in perms, hair coloring, and lightening substances. More on the stuff that you you purchase. Um, like over the counter, hair colors, those types of things. Most of the professional stuff now, we don't use ammonia in our products because it is very harsh. Um, it raises the pH and allows the solution to penetrate the hair. Ammonium hydroxide and ammonium theoglycolate are examples of ammonia compounds that are used to, to raise the pH. So what does pH stand for? pH stands for potential hydrogen, and it's the amount of hydrogen in a solution uh, measured on a logarithmic scale from 0 to 14, 7 as being the neutral. Um, so here's some actually really good examples of the pH scale. So on the acidic side, lemon juice, vinegar, hair and skin um, reside around the 5. Uh, distilled water is a 7. Baking soda, now we're getting into the alkaline side. And ammonia is very high on the pH scale at a 12. So acid, acids and bases. Water molecules separate into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. And pH measures the number of hydrogen ions in a solution. 
And a solution, if you remember, is the sol solute in the solvent. Uh, the more hydrogen ions, the lower the pH. So pure water has a natural pH of 7. The number of ion H ions, um, if you look at the picture at the bottom, so a water molecule is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. When you ionize it, you take away one of the, um, you make it a hydroxyl ion, and the hydrogen ion is on the side. And then neutral atom, um, a neutral atom becomes an ion either by losing an electron or gaining an electron. So depending on which way it goes. Acid alkali neutralization reactions. So pure water, which is HO2O, naturally ionizes to create hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. When acids and alkalis are mixed together in equal proportions, they neutralize each other to form water, which is H2O. Neutralizing shampoos and normalizing lotions used to neutralize hydroxide hair relaxers, relaxers work by creating an acid alkali neutralization reaction. So again, looking at the little picture that we have, it shows an acids contain hydrogen ions, also shown as H+. Bases contain hydrox hydroxides, also known as 0H-. Acids and bases together cancel each other out and make water. Neutralization. So the chemical reaction between an acid and an alkali is called neutralization. Acid plus alkali equals salt water. So if you add just the right amount of acid and alkali together, the, ne the neutral solution is formed. The pH value gets close to pH 7, which is neutral. So basically they're canceling each other out. So for your chemistry homework, in your theory workbook, you need to complete questions uh, number 1 to 90 um, in your uh, theory workbook. And then, I thought this was kind of a nice quote, the big secret in life is that there's no big secret. Whatever your goal, you can get there if you are willing to work. Now we're going to continue into chapter 13, uh, the basics of electricity. Again, so why do we need to study the basics of electricity? Um, we rely on a, a variety of e electrical appliances. Um, so understanding what electric electricity is, how it works, you need to be able to use it safely. Uh, basic understanding of electricity will enable you to properly use and care for your equipment and your tools. Um, electricity and its use impact other aspects of the salon environment, such as lighting, temperature, styling of the styling irons, um, it impacts the service that you offer to your clients. And it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about safety. So what is electricity? Electricity is the energy caused by moving electrons within an atom. Electrical energy is the energy of electric charges. So electrical current, the definition is electrical current is the rate of flow of electrical charges in a circuit. So showing an electrical circuit, you have an electrical cell and then leaving there has the connecting wire and it's a flow of electrons as an example, a light bulb, and then it comes into the light bulb and then back to the electric cell. So the charge are the little blue circles. The conductor is the wire that it moves along and the, um, the obviously the arrows are the flow. So the way those little blue dots flow through the, the wire is you know considered the electrical current. What is a conductor? So it's any material that allows a, um, electrical current to pass through it. So anything, the obviously metal, aluminum, steel, copper, um, any of those are considered a really good conductor of electricity. Um, that's why it's really important that, you know, not to be holding anything metal when you're standing in a, um, you know, like a puddle of water. So the insulator is the material that does not allow the electrical current to pass through it. Um, it's like the protective coating that they put around wires, like the plastic. 
um, or rubber or glass or cloth or wood. Those things do not allow electricity to pass through it or to it's not a conductor of electricity. Electricity can flow through the components in a complete electrical circuit. An incomplete circuit, um, so the electrical current cannot flow, means that they're not joined together. So if you don't have the plug plugged in, it doesn't have a constant flow. Um, a complete circuit, so the electrical current can flow and then light the bulb. Direct current. So everybody's heard of AC, DC um, when you're looking at anything to do with electrical. So direct current is a flow of charge that always flows in one direction. DC current is a current that does not change the direction in time. A battery produces direct current in a circuit, example, a portable flashlight. Um, so basically what that means is, you know, your battery creates um, the current in its circuit and feeds the light bulb. It doesn't come back around and meet. It's just one charge. So alternating current is, um, so direct current is when the current flows in only one direction, constant flow. Alternating current is the current flows in one direction and then the other. Electrical current whose magnitude and direction vary um, opposed to direct current whose direction remains con uh, constant. So an alternating current we look at is like um, an electrical outlet in your house. So when you plug something into your electrical outlet, that's alternating current because it's leaving the wall through your cord to your device and then coming back. So that means it's flowing out and then flowing back in. Whereas direct current, it only flows from the battery out to power, example, the flashlight. Um, an inverter is an apparatus that changes direct current to alternating current. They allow you to plug in appliances outside of the house that normally require a wall outlet. Example, the mobile phone charger. So this inverter, um, as you can see, it has many outlets to it. So you plug it into the cigarette lighter in your car and it changes um, the direct current that would be, you know, from the battery of your car basically into alternating current. So you can plug in, as you can see, it has um, an actual three prong plug. Um, it looks like it has cell phone jacks or um, plug ins, chargers, charger cords. So that basically changes the direct current of your car battery into an alternating current, which is the same as um, using a plug outlet in your house. So a rectifier changes alternating current to direct current. Um, so basically what that's doing is it's changing the current that needs to go both ways and changing it to only having to go one way. So electrical measurements. Volt or V, known as voltage, is a unit that measures the pressure or force that pushes the current through the conductor. Um, the ampere or amp uh, is the unit that measures the strength of an electrical current. A milliampere uh, is one one thousandth of an, of an amp used for facials and scalp treatments because amp one actual amp would be too strong. An ohm is a unit that measures the resistance of electrical current. Current will not flow through a conductor unless the force are stronger than the resistance. So, um, the ohm is basically the resistance. So think about swimming through the water. So the ohm is the water and you're swimming, which is um, the force or the volts that you need to swim through the water and the ohm is kind of holding you back. It's the resistance. And a watt is a unit that measures how much electrical energy is being used per second. A 40 watt light bulb uses 40 watts of energy per second and a kilowatt is 1000 watts. The electricity in your house is measured in kilowatt hours. 1000 watt hair dryer uses 1000 watts of energy per second. So you have a 1500 amp um, blow dryer, then you're using 1500 watts of energy per second, if you think about it in that regard. Electrical equipment safety. So 
Basically what it does, it prevents current from passing through a circuit. Um, it's designed to blow out or the fuse, um, actually a fuse, it prevents excessive current from passing through the circuit, designed to blow out or melt when the wire becomes too hot from overload. Um, when you have too many things plugged into an outlet, um, you know, you, nowadays we don't really have so much of a fuse. We have circuit breakers. So when it says, oh, I popped the breaker, uh, basically that's because you've overloaded that circuit and that's the protection of making sure that um, you're not going to overload and start a fire. It's a safety de device, basically. So your circuit breaker is a switch that automatically interrupts or shuts off an electrical circuit at the first indication of overload. Um, so if you've got like three things plugged into one, um, you you know, all of a sudden you start your blow dryer as an example and all of a sudden everything, it, it pops and shut off. That's the circuit breaker saying you're, you've got too much draw on that one circuit. You need to move things around or it's just going to continue to pop. Grounding. So grounding completes an electrical circuit and carries the current safely away. All electrical appliances must have at least two rectangular connections or prongs on the plug. These supply the electrical current to the circuit. The grounding pin. Some appliances have a third circular connection. This is a three-pronged plug. Uh, the grounding pin is designed to guarantee a safe path of the electricity and prevent electrical shock. Ground fault interrupters, or a GFI. They're designed to protect from electrical shock by interrupting the household circuit when there is a leak. GFIs are required by electrical code where there is water. It is designed to detect uh, currents few milliamperes and to trip a breaker at the receptacle uh, to remove a shock hazard. So the GFIs, we have them in the salon. You probably have them in your salon. You probably have them in your bathroom. They have like a little, um, a little button in the center of the two outlets. And if you overload that or get water near it, it automatically trips it and that little button pops out, which means you cannot get any hydro to that. And that is actually um, for safety reasons, especially when you're working anywhere with uh, water and electricity, which is basically what we do every single day. So the four common electrical safety devices is a surge protector. We all have them, you know, with our computers plugged in, our TVs plugged in, all that kind of stuff. Number two is a fuse. Um, that's, like I said, that's kind of a really old fuse. The ones that I kind of grew up with, they were like little circular fuses, little glass because glass um, is not a conductor of electricity. Um, the G, the GFI, which is the one you see there, the two plugs with the little red and the blue. The red is the one that pops out, which shows that um, um, something has been detected or, if, or they don't want to cause a shock. And to reset it, you, you hit the black button. And then a circuit breaker, obviously, is like in your panel. It's the, the big switches that once you flip it, it flips over, and then as soon as you click it back, it turns the, the hydro back on. And that's it for electricity. Um, so your electricity homework in your theory workbook is questions 1 to 24. So if you could make sure that you have all of that completed. And uh, I found a funny photo that made me think of the 80s, but Electrical Safety Day Obviously, you missed it if your hair looks like that. <laughs> Otherwise, um, hoping you guys have a great day. Thanks. Bye.